two wars that were fought by an infant navy. Let me ask you something. 1798 to 1805, now that seems mighty far away and long ago. Yes, it was. But these wars were proving grounds for the great fleets to come. They schooled commanders and their crews for future struggles and convinced the country that ocean commerce had to be protected by a navy. Let's go back to the year 1783. Well, another question. What was going on then? The British left New York at the end of the Revolution. The Treaty of Paris was signed. Eight years of struggle were over. American independence was won. In New York, Washington said farewell to his battle-tested officers. In Annapolis, he resigned his commission as commander-in-chief. He'd been first in war. And now he was first in peace and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Yes, he retired as a private citizen to farm his fields at Mount Vernon. Well, who are these folks here? A veteran's family. Home came the fighter, the soldier, and the sailor. Was that the size of our Navy? Not even one ship was left. victory over Britain appeared a hollow one. There was the weak central government. It had no power to tax. It relied on requests to the states. And with no common enemy to fight, the 13 states raised tax barriers, almost waged open war against each other. England refused to consider her former colonies as a truly independent nation. Foreign trade suffered. England, France, and Spain closed West Indian ports to United States ships. Unemployment followed debts. Veterans lost their homes and farms. Many sought new opportunities in the West. In 1786, in Massachusetts, revolt flared in Shays' Rebellion. Appears to me something had to be done. As a republic, we were mighty young and weak. We didn't want to be begging England to take us back. No, the tide turned. In Philadelphia, in 1787, the Constitution was written. But tell me, why did the states wrestle about the Constitution? Well, you see, each was afraid it would sacrifice too much to a central government. But adoption of the Bill of Rights guaranteed personal liberty to every individual. In 1789, Washington became first president. And Hamilton, first secretary of the Treasury, established government credit. America was ready to take its place in the family of nations. Vermont, the 14th state, joined the new union in 1791. Kentucky in 1792. Tennessee in 1796. Yes, but why in thunderation did these 16 states go to fight a war with France? At Yorktown, she was our ally, our comrade in arms. It never was declared war, but there was shooting. In the year 1789, the French Revolution burst into flames. At first, all Americans sympathized. They thought the French, too, wished to be independent of a king. Louis XVI was beheaded. Then the bloody reign of terror. Too much blood. Too much terror. England and her allies in Europe went to war against France. Washington, hoping for peace, proclaimed our neutrality. I'll calculate the French didn't like that. They wanted help from us, figured we were still allies. The French sent over an agent named Janet. He violated American neutrality. He outfitted privateers, recruited seamen, even tried to turn the American people against Washington. In 1797, our president, John Adams, wished to effect some sort of a reconciliation. He sent emissaries to France, but they weren't well received. Representatives of the French government, known only as Messieurs X, Y, Z, demanded bribes before they would even discuss a treaty. We were badly treated on land and on sea. The violence of the French Revolution spread. French privateers swarmed through the West Indies and along our Atlantic coast. By June of 1797, 
over 300 American merchant vessels had been taken by the French. In 1798, Congress voted reprisals, which were later extended to include the capture of armed French vessels anywhere. That meant war. An undeclared war fought entirely on the seas. That calls for a navy somehow. Yes, six new frigates had already been authorized by Congress, four of 44 guns and two of 36 guns. A separate department of the Navy was created in 1798. An energetic merchant and shipowner with vision was appointed the first secretary of the Navy, Benjamin Stoddart. He worked hard to build a fleet and laid a firm foundation for the development of the Navy. By the end of 1799, 33 vessels were built or purchased, outfitted, and manned. Under the new secretary of the Navy, the number of captains increased from three to 28, including Preble, Bainbridge, Rogers, Truxton. To build and maintain ships required shipyards, storehouses, materials, workmen near large cities. All kinds of seagoing men of war. What are these little critters? Well, generally, the small vessels of less than 20 guns were brigs or schooners, according to their rigs. Well, now take these three-masted fellows. Uh, how do you call them? Up to 24 guns, a three-master was called a sloop of war. 24 to 50 or more guns on two decks were frigates. The frigates were the largest ships in the American Navy at that time. Warships reached their greatest power and efficiency operating in squadrons and fleets. Then they could penetrate blockades and drive lighter vessels from the seas. For the first time, American squadrons were assigned definite stations convoying American merchant vessels and fighting the French wherever they went. The senior officer of the new United States Navy, Commodore John Berry of Revolutionary War fame, commanded the frigates United States and Constitution and eight smaller men of war. Commodore Truxton, in the Constellation and four lesser warcraft, cruised between St. Christopher and Puerto Rico. A third squadron was stationed in the Windward Passage between Cuba and Haiti under Commodore Tingey in the Ganges. And north of Cuba was Commodore Decatur Sr. in the Delaware and two revenue cutters, four runners of the United States Coast Guard. They held these stations when they were not home for repairs. They searched for privateers and escorted convoys of American merchant ships. The outstanding engagement of the war was off the island of Nevis, February 9, 1799. In a heavy sea, the French frigate Insurgent had lost her main topmast. Captain Barrault was escaping to the cover of St. Eustatius. The constellation, Commodore Truxton, overtook and forged ahead of her antagonist, raking her several times. engagement, the insurgent struck her colors. The French fired too high, but the Americans were able to hit between wind and water. Superiority in gunnery was to stand Americans in good stead. Yes, it's mighty handy for a Navy to know how to shoot. Southwest of Guadalupe, February 1st, 1800, the constellation again proved herself. For five hours, she exchanged broadsides with the heavier gun Vengeance. Truxton had a well-organized and a well-trained ship. He was near victory when the Constellation lost her mainmast and the Vengeance escaped over the horizon. Well, how did the war come out? Besides these frigate battles, our armed merchant vessels had hundreds of engagements with French privateers. But late in 1799, the government of France changed. The Directory fell. Napoleon Bonaparte was made first consul. Facing trouble in Europe, he wished to reach a settlement with America. A treaty was ratified in 1801. And that closed a war that wasn't a war, an undeclared one. Well, did we learn anything? Yes, the ships and men were battle-hardened for the struggle that followed with the Barbary Corsairs.
The Barbary state stretched along the northern coast of Africa. Arabs, Moors, Turks, Mohammedans, most of them. The Barbary states had practiced piracy for centuries. They sought plunder and captives to be held for ransom. They were experts at boarding and hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Why didn't the nations get together and stop them? Because the rulers of Europe distrusted each other, they would not make a combined effort against the Corsairs. The Barbary rulers were quick to take advantage of a young, weak nation like the United States. In accordance with time-honored practice, tribute was expected as a price for peace. As early as 1786, Thomas Jefferson realized diplomacy was helpless unless a navy was created and used. Protection money, a price for peace. A treaty with Algiers in 1796 cost the United States nearly one million dollars, including the gift of a new frigate. Peace with Tunis cost over a hundred thousand, and Tripoli, about 56,000. But the Pasha of Tripoli thought unprotected American trade too tempting. He repudiated the treaty and demanded $250,000 immediately and a yearly payment of $20,000. did not the United States say no to that? Indeed we did, and war was declared by Tripoli May 10, 1801. About June 1, 1801, Commodore Richard Dale's squadron left Hampton Roads. The President, the Philadelphia, Essex, and Enterprise. Dale cruised along the Barbary coast with a show of force. But four ships were not enough for an effective blockade of Tripoli. This force was enlarged by Commodore Richard Morris, the Constellation, Chesapeake, Adams, New York, and John Adams. But still not enough for the blockade. Their duties included convoying and showing the flag off Algiers, Tunis, and Morocco. And they replenished at Gibraltar. Soon to be given command of the Mediterranean squadron was a man who left a lasting imprint on the Navy, Commodore Edward Preble, who arrived on station in the Constitution. Little known to his officers at first, he was a strict disciplinarian. Born in the state of Maine, he'd fought in the Revolution. Preble was a great leader. He was firm. He had fighting spirit. He had character. A commander passes on these qualities. His officers were well-schooled. They were given high standards and were in themselves great commanders with the Preble fighting spirit. Two serious obstacles were ahead. Trouble with Morocco across from Gibraltar. The Sultan of Morocco saw that the American ships at Preble's orders were cleared for action. So he up and changed his mind. He renewed the Treaty of 1786 with no further demands on the United States. Bad luck here with the Philadelphia. She had been sent ahead to blockade Tripoli. Chasing an enemy craft close inshore, she hit an uncharted reef. Ran aground, eh? What did the skipper do to get her off? Well, Captain Bainbridge laid all sails aback tried to lighten ship, he cut away her foremast, cast off her anchors, jettisoned many of her guns, but kept some to fight with. After four hours, Bainbridge had to surrender. The enemy floated the Philadelphia and brought her in triumphantly. The Pasha of Tripoli was pleased. He held the Philadelphia's officers and crew for an enormous ransom. But Commodore Preble was not pleased. A powerful American ship was now turned against him. He had only the frigate Constitution of equal metal to meet her. He decided to destroy the Philadelphia. Lieutenant Stephen Decatur, Jr., commander of the Enterprise, volunteered to head an expedition to enter an enemy harbor and capture and burn a large warship. This called for volunteers. Aboard the Enterprise, every officer, man, and boy stepped forward. He selected five officers and 62 men. A Sicilian pilot, Salvadore Catalano, knew the harbor. They set out in a captured Tripolitan catch with Mediterranean rig, renamed the Intrepid. 
Boldly, they sailed into the enemy harbor. A plan of attack had been carefully worked out and rehearsed. They would capture the Philadelphia by a united rush. They would then split into details to set her afire. One hundred yards away, they were hailed. Catalano, the pilot, answered. He claimed that a storm had stripped them of anchors and requested permission to tie up alongside. The breeze gave out. Be calmed. Twenty yards away from the heavy guns of the frigate. Almost alongside. It was called a bold and daring act. This was from a British admiral, the great Lord Nelson. Decatur was promoted to captain and presented with a sword by a grateful Congress. Yep, he raided it. Now, what's that peculiar floating object? That's a bomb vessel for siege work. Commodore Prebo borrowed two of them from the king of the two Sicilies. He was going to close in and bombard Tripoli. Preble sailed into the harbor of Tripoli with a squadron of schooners and brigs. The Enterprise, Nautilus, Argus, Siren, Scourge, Vixen. In addition to six gunboats mounting one gun each, two bomb vessels, and the flagship, Constitution. With him were over 1,000 officers and men. They were attacking a walled city, defended by an army of 25,000, by forts, and batteries mounting 115 guns, and a Tripolitan naval force of a brig, two schooners, two large galleys, and 19 gunboats. The first attack began on August 3, 1804. Preble took his entire fleet within point-blank range of the shore batteries. Captain Summers commanded the first gunboat division. Captain Stephen Decatur, the second. Enemy ships and shore batteries opened up at grape-shot distance. Captain Decatur advanced toward the enemy's eastern division of nine gunboats. The enemy closed. Captain Summers, even with his sweeps out, couldn't fetch windward to join Decatur. In gunboat number one, he bore down on five of the enemy's western division, engaged within pistol shot, and drove them among the rocks. Captain Decatur, in number four gunboat, carried one enemy gunboat and then took a second. Was saved by Reuben James. Lieutenant Tripp, in gunboat number six, boarded an enemy, was cut off. He cleared the deck and hauled down the enemy colors. The brother of Stephen Decatur, Lieutenant James Decatur, was the only officer killed. Preble broke off the action but returned four days later. The bomb vessels threw shells into the town. From their prison ashore, Bainbridge, former captain of the Philadelphia, and his officers watched the battle. Their men had been forced to carry ammunition for the enemy. The Pasha of Tripoli gave no sign of yielding his city or asking for peace. Another idea, a fire ship loaded with explosives to destroy the harbor shipping and shatter the Pasha's castle. 
the same intrepid that had burned the Philadelphia. In her hold, 100 barrels of powder, 150 shells. Slow burning fuses led to the powder magazine. The intrepid, Captain Summers, was manned by a volunteer crew of 13. Hmm, 13. Preble waited. And the Argus, Nautilus, and Vixen stood by to take off the crew of the fire ship. Would the intrepid repeat her great deed? Would her luck hold? The enemy was rested. Luck didn't hold. Subsequently, Preble was ordered home, and the Pasha was now faced by Commodore Barron. The new Commodore brought off William Eaton, Navy agent for the Barbary States, who had a plan. The brother of the Pasha of Tripoli was Hamet Karamanli. He had claimed the throne of Tripoli, had been defeated, and driven into Egypt. It was Eaton's idea to put Hamet back on the throne of Tripoli. A native army of 400 men was gathered in Egypt. Frequent disorders and desertions among them reduced this number. From the fleet came seven United States Marines. They were under Lieutenant O'Bannon. And this army started out with 107 camels. Egypt, nearly 600 miles across the Libyan desert to Derna. It was an extraordinary march, one of the most difficult in military history. With the Marine Corps, it was the start of a great tradition, a march from Egypt to the shores of Tripoli. Supplies were received from the Argus and Hornet. Reaching Derna, the attack was coordinated with the guns of the Argus, Hornet, and Nautilus. Guns on which the hope of victory rested. in the Mediterranean, and at home for a while. Well, did the war teach us anything? Yes, commerce needs naval protection. The United States, refusing to tolerate piracy, had humbled the proud rulers of Barbary and gained prestige in the eyes of the world. The young Navy had beaten the pirates at their favorite hand-to-hand -hand tactics, adding to the growth of a fighting tradition. The war produced great leaders, Preble, Decatur, Tripp, and Summers. Bainbridge, who will emerge from captivity to win victory. Other names that will be heard again. Hull, Rogers, Porter, McDonough, Perry, Lawrence. America made it known at home and abroad that to keep a peace and to keep honor, there must be ships that can fight and men who can lead.